Hey everyone, I hope you are all doing well. Um, this is an introduction by Barbara C. Allen to the uh, volume of the edited volume of documents uh, from the workers' opposition uh, faction in the uh, Russian Communist Party. The title of the book is the Workers Opposition in the Russian Communist Party, Documents 1919 to 1930. Um, I don't know how many of these actual, this is a huge book, full of like, a, with a rich treasure, treasure trove of uh, primary <coughs> source documents on this subject, but uh, I'm probably only going to be reading uh, the introductions. It seems like there's pretty substantial introductions to each section. So for instance, uh, looking at the table of contents, uh, the sections are that each have an introduction. You know, the first uh, document uh, for the first section is on page 29. And before that, the introduction starts on page 11. So, um, I probably, if I, the usage I'll get out of this book is I'll probably uh, just uh, read these introductions uh, to get an overall feel for the workers' opposition and uh, the context uh, in which they operated um, before I even begin to think about reading these uh, straight from the horse's mouth uh, primary source uh, documents. Um, I've listened to a few Barbara C. Allen talks before, particularly on the uh, Social Histories of Revolution uh, YouTube channel that is now uh, defunct but still has very, very uh, great, uh, important lectures on there. Um, about uh, 20th century uh, revolutions um, and counter revolutions, of course. So, yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, Real quick, uh, reads the sections that are in this book. Um, background to the trade union debate, March 1919 to autumn 1920. The workers' opposition in formation. Section 2 is the trade union discussion. December 1920 to March 1921. The workers' opposition as a fully formed legal faction. From the ban on the factions through the 11th Party Congress, 1921-22, to former worker oppositionists respond to the new economic policy and to repression against them. 4. The, the, the final, I think this is the final section. Yeah, this is the final section. It is titled, Former Worker Oppositionist in the Debates of the NEP Era and During the First Five-Year Plan, 1922-1930. Um, relevant to this is I have the theses of the workers' opposition on here uh, from Alexander Shlyapnikov, if you're interested in listening to that. Um, also, I have a few pieces from R.V. Daniels, who wrote a book, uh, The Conscience of the Revolution, which is about opposition groups within the uh, uh, Russian Communist Party up to uh, the Stalin period. So it has, you know, uh, the Democratic Centralist, it has uh, the Workers Group, um, it has... Uh, the early, um, even earlier than the democratic centrists, like the um, early critiques of Soviet policy by the so-called um, left communists. Um, then it goes on to uh, Trotskyist opposition, Zinoviev opposition, the United opposition, the right opposition, and so on and so forth. Uh, I have not finished that book, but I have uh, Conscience of the Revolution, but I have um, pieces uh, by R.V. Daniels on here that are relevant to this uh, discussion, uh, or relevant to this topic.
کرد It looks like there's a, in the beginning there's a thing called explanatory notes before the introduction, so I'll read that as well. Uh, okay. Uh, notes about translation. There are numerous Russian terms for trade unions or unionism. Two fairly equivalent names are abedin, abedinenia and zoyutsi for unions, although zoyuts, zoyuts can refer to a type of union unrelated to trade unions. The, per, the term professionally suizi, suizi, I don't know, can be translated as professional unions or trade unions. Not only the white collar type, but also industrial unions are encompassed under this term. There is also a narrower term for industrial unions, plevadzetsveni, zuizi, <clears throat> which is literally translated as production unions. Sometimes the term trade unionism is encountered. It is a transliteration of the English term trade unionism into Russian, but it applies strictly to the reformist non-revolutionary trade union movement. Manual workers are robochi, the term robotnik, which is often translated as worker, refers less to a manual worker and more to one who carries out organizational, agitational, or propaganda work for the political party or work on behalf of a government department. Therefore, I have to translate robotniki as personnel or even activists. A music is a male peasant. Other terms relevant to the peasantry are bednota or bedniachestvo for poor peasantry, and bedniak, for poor peasant, kulak, for rich peasant, and kulachestvo, for rich peasantry, and serednyak, for middle peasant. Intelligent, singular noun, and intelligentsia, collective noun, usually for, refer to radical leftist intellectuals. <coughs> Zavod is a factory, and fabrika, can be translated as factory, plant, or mill. <clears throat> economy can be rendered in Russian as economika or kazi etsvo. Uh, Kazia etsvo can also mean farm or peasant holding. Narodno koziaistvo. Distinguishes the general or national economy from smaller units. Verki and Nitsi refer to the power relations between groups in society or in the political party. The terms translate literally as higher ups and larger downs or heights and depths. Nitsi can also be translated as rank and file or grassroots. Verki might also be translated as leaders or bosses. The term Samo Samodiatonost can be translated literally as self-activity, but other possibilities include initiative, enterprise, amateur activity, agency, independence, and self-organization. In the Russian Revolution and Retreat, a great book by the way, Simon Perani argues that the term as used by the Russian Communist Party and Soviet government evolved from 1917 to 1920 away from, quote, creativity to, quote, voluntary worker participation in the tasks of economic construction, tasks that workers had no role in setting, end quote. Parani, 2008. A note about transliteration. This book follows a modified version of the U.S. Library of Congress transliteration system. It substitutes Y for the Cyrillic hard sign. Uh, fucking, I don't know. And emits di it's a Russian symbol. And emits diacritical remarks for the soft sign and another Russian symbol. Uh, names ending with some Russian symbol are translated with a Y. Names ending in another Russian symbol are translated with Y. Sorry, I can't tell you what those symbols are. 
Um, but hopefully, uh, I don't know. If you know Russian, something I said there made sense to you. And if not, you're, you just have to bear with me. Uh, a notes, notes about measurements. Arshin is 28 inches or 71 centimeters. Desiatina, Desiatina is two, equal to 2.7 acres. Pud, about 36.11 pounds or 16.38 kilograms. Zatsin, equal to 2.13 meters. Note about St. Petersburg, Petrograd, Leningrad. Around 1703, the city of St. Petersburg replaced Moscow as Russia's capital in 1712. Affectionately, its residents called it Pitter. After, the world, after World War I erupted, authorities renamed it Petrograd in a patriotic gesture. The Petersburg Committee of the Bolshevik Party retained its name even after the city name changed to Petrograd because the Bolsheviks opposed the war and resisted patriotic sentiment. The capital was returned to Moscow in 1918. After Lenin died in 1924, the city was renamed Leningrad to honor him. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, same, the name St. Petersburg was restored to it. Note about protocols and stenographic reports of party congresses and conferences. Party Congress proceedings were published either as protocols or stenographic reports. A stenographic report was usually a full record of open sessions of a Congress, although in exceptional cases, speeches were censored. Protocols often were abbreviated records, providing only major speeches and decisions, although sometimes they were more complete. In the early years of Soviet power, Stenographic records of party congress and conference speeches were usually offered to speakers for correction before being entered into the official stenographic report. Some speakers opted to make corrections while others did not. Speakers may have made changes in order to correct the stenographer's errors or to polish and perhaps even add to the recorded version of their oral presentations. The published stenographic reports reflect the fact that some speeches were corrected and others not. Where I have consulted the original uncorrected stenographic records, I have indicated so. I have also attempted to find complete versions of censored speeches and have indicated whether these are full versions. Note about the naming of the workers' opposition. According to some members of the workers' opposition, Lenin or the party central committee gave the group its name, Often those who criticized the group referred to it ironically as the, quote, so-called, end quote, workers' opposition. In some original documents, workers' opposition is placed within quotation marks, perhaps ironically. I have chosen to omit the quotation marks, which editors may have inserted without consideration of the speaker's or writer's intentions. The group's name sometimes appears in lowercase and other times in uppercase in the documents. I have changed it to uppercase consistently. Note about the Soviet trade union organizational structure. Within trade unions, as within other Soviet organizations, there were several leading bodies. The Presidium was the, quote, official, end quote, leading body. Its non-party members were a small minority who had no real influence over the organization's decisions. The Presidium was formed out of the Central Committee of the Union. Within the Central Committee, the Communist faction held real power and it elected, with the party CC's approval, a bureau, of its, excuse me, a bureau as its leading body. Bureau members usually held dual posts in the Presidium, so Communists made up the majority of the Presidium. In the early years of the Soviet state, unions also had a chair, but as the party exerted greater control over unions, its leaders preferred to substitute collegial bodies for elected chairs. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Introduction. We're there. The Russian Revolution of 1917 unfolded in the context of war-induced economic crisis which brought about the collapse of the imperial Russian state. 
The at first liberal, then moderately socialist provisional government, which replaced it, was in it unable to extract Russia from the crisis successfully. The Bolsheviks, having seized power from this caretaker government, bore partial responsibility for the state's collapse, yet they assumed responsibility for the challenge of rebuilding the state as global wars segued into civil war. The Bolsheviks' dreams of empowering formerly oppressed industrial workers and poor peasants were tempered by the need to establish firm control over a vast territory populated by a few supporters, many who opposed their rule, and many others who simply sought to survive. Even some among the Bolsheviks, renamed the Russian Communist Party in 1918, feared that the, quote, proletarian dictatorship, end quote, was in danger of becoming a dictatorship of party and government higher-ups. Footnote. Far more has been written on these themes than I can accommodate in this footnote. Among the works that have most influenced me are Rabinovich, 1976, Rabinovich, 2007, Riley, 1986, Riley, 2002, Berzilov, 1987, Carr, 1950-53, Fitzpatrick, 1983, Hazagawa, 1981, Conker, 1985, Conker et al., 1989, Skri... excuse me, Skliarevsky, 1993, Smith, 1983, Thompson, 1981, Wade, 1984, Wade, 2000. I think some of those names are Alexander Rabinowicz, I don't know who Riley is, E.H. Carr, Sheila Fitzpatrick, uh, I think it's Diane P. Coenker, uh, Smith is uh, Stephen A. Smith, um, not the sports announcer guy, um, uh, and I think it's a uh, Rex V. Wade? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. End footnote. When the Bolsheviks took power, they had not fully resolved the relationship between the party Soviets and trade unions. Winning the Civil War at first took priority over organizational matters, but these rose again in 1919-20. to 20. Debate over trade unions' role in the economy and their relationship with the Communist Party was fierce and produced distinct platforms identified with Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and the workers' opposition. Due to the contentious nature of the trade union debate, discussion was opened in December 1920 to party members as a whole. Footnote. Among the most important English language secondary accounts of the trade union debates, see Daniels, 1988, uh, 1960, that's probably uh, um, The Conscience of the Revolution, Holmes, 1990, uh, Simon Pirani, 2008, I believe it's Leonard Shapiro, 1956, and Sorensen, 1969. I might have gotten some or all of those names wrong. Probably just some. Um, the workers' opposition, which existed from 1919 to 1922 in the Russian Communist Party Bolsheviks, was a movement of communist and industrial trade unions who attempted to address problems of economic management that arose in the context of economic crisis that accompanied the Russian Civil War and of the party's attempt to establish a dictatorship. Prominent leaders were Alexander Shlyapnikov, Sergei Medvedev, Alexei Kisilev, Ivan Ktuzov, Alexander Tolokinsev, and Yuri Lutovinov. These individuals were skilled Petrograd metal workers who had been union and party organizers before 1917. Bolshevik feminist Alexandra Kolontai mentored the group and supported it by speaking and writing on its behalf. Biography, footnote, biographies of Kolontai include Clements 1979, Farnsworth 1980, Porter 2014, and footnote. 38 Leaders of trade unions and industry signed the final program of the workers' opposition. Support for the workers' opposition was found in Moscow, Nizhny 
Novgorod, Zamara, and the Donbass, and other industrial centers. But each subgroup emphasized aspects of the group's program differently. The group traced its ideological origin to the Revolutionary Communist Party B program adopted in March 1919. The group's opponents in the party's central committee labeled it, quote, workers' opposition, end quote. This term was not a new one in party history. The history of the term, quote, workers' opposition, end quote, in the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party dated as far back as 1900, when radical intellectuals used the term workers' opposition to refer to uncooperative groups of workers in Ekaterinoslav and Kharkov. The Russian Jewish Socialist Movement saw tensions arise between workers and circle leaders in the 1880s and 1890s, especially over the relationship between political and economic goals. The term also was applied to Earl's workers, who in 1918 supported the anti-Bolshevik All-Russian Constituent Assembly Committee in Samara. Footnote. C. Waldman, 1967, Mendelssohn, 1965, and Pavlyuchenkov, 2008. And footnote. As a hostile term, the name workers' opposition drove a wedge between worker and intelligent socialists. It may be that Shlyapnikov and his supporters did not choose this name for themselves, but that Lenin foisted it upon them. Accused by party leaders of having created dangerous factions, members of the workers' opposition came to emphasize the movement's informality and short life. There is no precise date on which the group coalesced. No conference or congress marked its founding. Scattered by the Civil War, Petrograd metal workers at the forefront of Bolshevik organizing in 1917, and they began to reunite in the All-Russian Metal Workers Union in late 1919, whereupon Shlyapnikov's proposals for trade union management of the economy and workerization of the party galvanized their support. His supporters arranged meetings by word of mouth. Attendance at the meetings fluctuated, which makes it difficult to tally the group's membership. Arguing that the workers' opposition was built upon currents of, quote, critical thought, end quote, that circulated among the, quote, masses, end quote, in the summer of 1920, Alexandra Kolontai emphasized its popular roots, yet she claimed that it formed a faction only after party leaders had done so. Shlyapnikov later gave the impression that the workers' opposition came into being only after the Fifth Trade Union Conference in November 1920. Footnote. Um, Colin Tai, 1921b. Um, something, something, blah, blah, blah. June 1933, Shlepnikov's party purge session. And footnote. The program of the workers' opposition assumed that trade unions representing industrial workers and engineers should lead economic recovery in order to ensure worker mastery over production rather than worker subordination to production. This goal rested on the assumption that workers and technical personnel had valuable knowledge and experience that could help resolve economic problems. The workers' oppositionists regarded trade unions, which by 1920 were in communist hands, as more worker-oriented and revolutionary than were many party committees. The party, they thought, needed a new influx of working-class members and leaders in order to restore its revolutionary character, which they thought had deteriorated during the Civil War. Contrary to opponents' charges, their program was neither syndicalist nor anarchist, but was rooted in the multifaceted tradition of the Bolshevik Party, end of international Marxism. The workers' opposition emphasized that its program was based on principles laid out in earlier all-Russian trade union congresses, but that it stemmed in particular from the economic section of the party program, which was passed at the 8th Party Congress in March 1919. One second.
when I read the introduction about the 8th Congress of the Russian Communist Party. Um, the 8th Congress of the Russian Communist Party was held in Moscow the 18th to the 23rd of March 1919. The Congress was attended by 301 voting delegates who represented 313,766 party members. A further 102 delegates attended with speaking rights but no vote. It elected the 8th Central Committee. The opposition has complained that the militarization of industry during the Civil War... This is back to the text. The opposition has explained, complained that the militarization of industry during the Civil War had forced trade unions into a role not accorded to them by party resolutions. In practice, the role of the trade unions in production had been re relegated to that of, quote, an office of inquiry and recommendation, end quote. That was from a piece in Pravda, 1921, January 1921, pre-10th Party Congress. <laughs> Where am I? All right, back to the text. End footnote. The workers' opposition blamed the marginal role of the unions in production on growing bureaucratization. The only remedy to this for this for this unfortunate state of affairs was for unions to implement economic policy. Following the 1919 party program, the plan called for trade unions to, quote, concentrate in their hands management of the entire economy as a single unit, end quote. Reform had to begin at the lowest level and extend upward to the central leadership. First, trade unions would immediately receive more staff and resources. Then unions and factory committees would supersede state economic bodies in the organization and management of the economy. Finally, unions would nominate, install, and recall economic managers without interference from SNKH. Excuse me, VSNKH. Um, I need to look this up again. I'm, I'm confused by the VSNK. Uh, was it the VSNKH um, and the GOSP plan? Uh, the VSNKH is an abbreviation for the Supreme Board of the National Economy, Superior Board of the People's Economy, was the superior state institution of management of the economy of the RSFSR and later of the Soviet Union. There were two institutions with this name at different times between 1917 and 1932, and then between 1963 and 1965. On all levels, opinion represent excuse me, on all levels, back back to the text. On all levels, union representatives would be elected in order to ensure mass participation in economic management. Within the trade unions, higher levels would be accountable to lower ones through direct elections and periodic reporting, and lower levels would report to higher ones. Union representatives would assemble in all Russian producer congresses for each branch of the economy and for the economy overall. To facilitate such representation, management of industries would be rationalized, quote, according to the pr to production feature, end quote, such as metalworking, mining, textiles, etc. A factory-level worker assembly, elected by, quote, organized producers, end quote, would be the basic organizational unit of the union. The proposals made clear that both manual workers and white-collar employees would elect management bodies. All separate leading bodies, including factory committees, wage rate committees, shop committees, and so on, would come together into one factory assembly to meet two or four times per month and decide all important questions facing the factory. The primary allegiance of each factory organization, therefore, would be to the factory assembly rather than to hire organizations outside the factory. Finally, in order to improve the workers' standard of living and raise their productivity, the workers' opposition recommended banning all payments in kind. Necessities including food, clothes, transport, and housing will be provided for workers, but would not be distributed in place of actual regular wages. Having developed, excuse me, there's a footnote here, 
No, it's just a citation for something in Russian that I don't understand. <laughs> Having developed a well-organized and theoretically based attack upon the workers' opposition, Vladimir Lenin undercut its claims to legitimacy by arguing that 0.5 of the party's 1919 economic program would indeed be implemented, but not until trade unions were ready. Lenin, Grigory Zinoviev, and Nikolai Bukharin promoted the accusation that the workers' opposition fostered syndicalism, that it was a, quote, anarcho-syndicalist, petty bourgeois deviation, end quote. Party leaders also associated the workers' opposition with anti-Bolshevik forces, warning that it would not allow non-party workers to manage production. By this time, communists often understood, quote, non-party, end quote, to mean former Mensheviks, SRs, or anarchists. Bukharin claimed that a Congress of non-party metal workers, mainly Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, the, the group, the party, had passed a resolution, quote, nearly the same as, end quote, that of the workers' opposition, focusing on the workers' opposition's call for a, quote, Congress of producers, end quote, Party leaders claimed that a producers' congress would have meant allowing non- and semi-proletarian producers, that is to say peasants and artisans, to exert influence over economic decisions. Insinuating that Shlepnikov's years of work in French trade unions had contaminated his Marxism, Bukharin scoffed at that the, quote, Proudhonist, end quote, term, quote, producer, end quote, emerged from French syndicalism, describing the, quote, mass, end quote, of the working class is, quote, peasant-oriented, end quote, Bukharin insisted that a Congress of producers could not avoid channeling peasant perspectives into management of the economy. Forced onto the defensive, Shlepnikov insisted that the workers' opposition was not anarcho-syndicalist because it did not, quote, repudiate political struggle, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the party's leading role, nor the significance of the Soviets' as bodies of power, end quote. Moreover, it did not advocate decentralized ownership of production, which was the core of syndicalism, as he pointed out. <laughs> Slepnikov tried to explain that by a Congress of Producers, the op oppositionists essentially meant, quote, an all-Russian Congress of Trade Unions, end quote. By, quote, producers, end quote. The oppositionists meant, quote, factory and plant workers, white-collar staff, and all personnel necessary for production, end quote. Peasants could not be included, he insisted, for at that time there were no peasant unions in the RSFSR. Furthermore, Shlyapnikov claimed Marxist legitimacy for the term, quote, producer, end quote, for it originated with Engels. Lenin deftly retorted that Engels was speaking of communist society, not a society in transition, while class war was ongoing. Zinoviev asserted that the workers' opposition had employed the term cynically or carelessly, quote, in order to give their pro-worker platform a broader appeal, end quote. Shlepnikov maintained that he only desired an inclusive term that would apply to all those who contributed to industrial production, whether through manual or intellectual labor. Unable to, perfort, in, in, excuse me, unable to refute party intelligenti on theoretical grounds, Shlepnikov could only conclude with irony that no matter what term he used, his opponents would have twisted its meaning to exaggerate his alleged departures from orthodoxy. If Shlepnikov had used the term, quote, workers, end quote, rather than, quote, producers, end quote, Shlepnikov claimed that he would have been charged with Mikhaevism, um, which is uh, referring to uh, Jan Mahaisky, I think it's, I think it's Jan, who uh, was uh, critical at this time of the separation with uh, in the radical uh, milieu uh, between uh, the head and hand, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, manual and intellectual uh, laborers. Um, very important figure, actually.
You can't. Well, I should probably just copy McCabeism. Um, yeah, Jan Vaklov Mahaisky. Often corrupted in Russian as Mikhaev. Lived from 1866 to 1926. Was a Polish revolutionary whose methodology drew from both Marxism and anarchism, whilst criticizing both as products of the intelligentsia. Back to the text. At his purge in 1933, Shlepnikov seemed to have accepted that he had erred in the use of, quote, producers, end quote, for he recalled, quote, when Lenin said to me that, quote, producer, end quote, could be understood as, quote, commodity producer, end quote, I was indignant, but of course I cannot deny the fairness of such a rebuke, end quote. <laughs> Russian syndicalists did not recognize the workers' opposition as kindred to them, merely regarding it as part of a Bolshevik family feud. A strict definition of syndicalism truly did not fit the workers' opposition because it accepted the Communist Party as equal to the trade unions and because its proposals depended on a centralist rather than federalist structure. According to Wayne Thorpe, Western European syndicalists were, quote, non-political socialists, end quote, who, quote, repudiated political activity and organization in favor of revolutionary action, channeled through the workers' primary organizations, the trade unions, themselves organized ideally on a decentralized or federalist basis, end quote. The workers' opposition shared the syndicalist optimism about the potential of workers, yet this only marked both groups as workerist. Ouvierist, workerist, or French. Uh, this meant that they had a working class background, were active in trade unions, and advocated the direct participation of workers in creating a socialist manner of work and life. Granted, Wayne Thorpe, whose definitions are rooted in the context of French syndicalism, acknowledges that syndicalists varied by country and region. Is there anything on Wayne Thorpe? He wrote a book about. Uh, syndicalism uh, with um, Marcel van der Linden. <laughs> yeah, it, says, it just says that he wrote a book uh, titled The Workers Themselves, Revolutionary Syndicalism and International Labor, 1913 to 1923, in 1989. And it's about uh, international development of syndicalism. Cool. <laughs> um... A representative assembly based on um, back to the text. A representative assembly based on delegates elected by vocation was unique to syndicalists. This was had been a component of corporatist theory. The idea was especially popular directly after World War One, although the leftist variant died by out by the late nineteen twenties. The Congress of Producers advocated by the workers' opposition had no political role, which their program allocated to Soviets. Moreover, the type of representation proposed by the workers' opposition for the Congress and its scope of activity was significantly different from producer congresses proposed by many corporatists and syndicalists. Nevertheless, the anarcho-syndicalist label persisted both in Soviet historiography and in many Western studies. The program of the workers' opposition had no provisions on the nationality question. Other than advocating equal pay for women workers, worker opposition has paid little attention to combating, and combating entrenched misogyny. The workers' opposition was primarily a movement of ethnically Russian male metal workers whose leaders assumed that class-based priorities 
overrode ethnic and gender questions and that proposals to promote workers' decision-making would resolve the problems of women and national minorities. A sense that they were oblivious to the grievances of minority nationalities may have limited their program's appeal to non-Russians and may have even raised suspicions that they were insensitive or even hostile towards some non-Russians. For example, the democratic centralist leader Rafael and Emilian Yaroslavsky, later a party historian and leader of anti-religious propaganda, insinuated that the workers' opposition employed anti-Semitic rhetorical devices to start working-class anger against party intellectuals. In the wake of the Kronstadt uprising, Radek and the other party ideologues linked members of the workers' opposition to black hundreds and white counter-revolutionaries, but these charges were patently ludicrous. Uh. Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking for um if there's anything on Rafael or Emilian Yaroslavsky. Ye Yemel Jan Mikhailovich Yaroslavsky, who lived from 1878 to 1943, was a Bolshevik revolutionary, Communist Party functionary, journalist, and historian, an atheist and anti religious polemicist. Yaroslavsky served as editor of the atheist satirical magazine Bez Bosnik, the Godless, and led the League of the Militant Godless Organization. Yaroslavsky also headed the anti-religious committee of the Central Committee. In his book, How Gods and Godlesses Are Born, Live and Die, published in 1923, Yaroslavsky argued that religion was born under man, lived under man, and would die under communism. Back to the text. My examination of workers' oppositionist de rhetoric did not reveal anti-Semitism. In Shlepnikov's speeches and publications, he took pains to emphasize his lack of ethnic chauvinism. The workers' opposition in Ukraine included members who were Ukrainian and Jewish, although Russians were in the majority. When a metal worker named I. Mok, possibly Jewish, under investigation for illegal factionalism in 1923, was asked if he ever encountered anti-Semitism among members of the workers' opposition. He answered that he had not, and that in his opinion, they were far too ideologically, quote, conscious, end quote, Marxist to fall victim to such prejudice. Nevertheless, such powerful rumors probably helped to discredit the workers' opposition among non-Russians and intelligent party members. Uh, intelligent there is in... Uh, um, Italics. Um. Hundreds of party members voted in favor of the program of the workers' opposition, especially at trade union conferences, although far more voted for the platform endorsed by Lenin, which called for a long period of education for workers before they could manage the economy. Despite support in trade unions for the workers' opposition, Communist Party leaders controlled material resources, directed state policy, and determined the fate of unions. Trade unions had large memberships, but they did not command the resources necessary to overcome the party. Also, Lenin's political strategy was more effective than that of the workers' opposition in de gathering delegates for the 10th Congress of the Russian Communist Party in March 1921, which decided the trade union question. Finally, the Kronstadt Rebellion and Workers' Protest in Petrograd on the eve of the Congress made the workers' opposition vulnerable to accusations of heresy by party leaders. The workers' opposition was not only defeated the Congress, but also censored and factionalism was banned. For, nevertheless, some of its members continued to argue that the party was not doing enough to promote worker initiative. 
The workers' opposition has participated in the intra-party factional struggles of the 1920s and promoted industrialization. Purged from the party in 1930s, many perished in Stalin's terror of 1937-38. to This collection builds upon my already published biography of workers' opposition leader Alexander Slyapnikov, for it provides an English translation entire text of documents that I analyze in the biography. Although several collections of documents of the workers' opposition and on the trade union debates were published in Soviet Russia in the 1920s, very few of these documents have been translated into English. The editors of such volumes wanted to show the workers' opposition was wrong, and this goal influenced their selection of documents. Scholars and interested people, lay people outside of the former USSR, know of the group chiefly through Alexander Kolontai's 1921 booklet, Rabochaya Abzitsiya, which for for which other leaders of the workers' opposition refused to take responsibility. Uh, that book's called The Workers' Opposition. For that reason, and back to the text, for, for that reason, and more importantly, because the booklet has been published in translation many times, I have chosen not to include it in this volume. Less well-known documents authored by Kolontai are included. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union and opening of the archives, more documents have come to light which demonstrate how the views of the leaders of the workers' opposition evolved with the introduction of the new economic policy and the mixed economy that the new economic policy heralded. This translated a collection of groups, the group's documents is intended to draw attention to previously unpublished or published but untranslated documents in order to illuminate little-known aspects of the workers' opposition's ideas, proposals, and tactics, and how these evolved during the group's existence and after it formally disbanded. Providing scholars and activists with access to the original sources in translation may allow them to reassess previously held assumptions about the group's stances, which are tainted by being filtered through the interpretations of Russian Communist Party leaders. One might legitimately ask whether a document collection of the workers' opposition should include materials from the period after the group officially ceased to exist. I have chosen to do so in order to shed light on the role that the memory of the workers' opposition played in the intra-party debates of the 1920s. Although the workers' opposition formally disbanded after the 10th Party Congress in March 1921, and its program of 1920-21 to was not entirely relevant to the context in which the new economic policy unfolded in 1921-28, to some of its former members continued to defend the role of trade unions in administering the economy, urgency, the urgency of giving workers a predominant role in party committees, and the need for greater democracy and more open debate within the party. Some former oppositionists, but also others who had not signed the group's program, lodged an appeal with the Executive Committee of the Communist International in 1922, protesting that Russian Communist Party leaders suppressed workers' voices within the party. Further, a few members of the workers' opposition joined the workers' group of the Russian Communist Party B in 1923 to 24, but Gavril Miaznikov, the leader of the workers' group, had not supported the proposals of the workers' opposition about trade union management of the economy. Miaznikov favored a greater role for Soviets over the economy. Although some former members of the workers' opposition met privately with members of the workers' group in 1923, the two groups could not come to a consensus about their positions. Still another group that arose in the period of intra-party debate in 1923-24 to was Workers' Truth, which seems to have had nothing in common organizationally with the workers' opposition. Alexander Bogdanov's thought influenced this group's proposals, although Bogdanov disclaimed any responsibility for the activity of Workers' Truth. Footnote. For more on these groups, see Alkina, 2006, Average, 1984, Bordyugov, 1995, Miaznikov, 1995, Pirani, 2008, and Vilkova, 2004. 
A Russian philosopher, revolutionary, and novelist, Bogdanov was a lifetime rival of Lenin, for he offered an anti-authoritarian vision of Bolshevism that emphasized transformation of relations among people to eliminate the distinctions between those who command and those who execute orders. Hmm. Bogdanov founded the proletarian culture, prolet cult movement, which produced a journal, organized a proletarian university, and imagined a workers' encyclopedia. See White, 2018. Yuri Mialnov of Samara has drawn was drawn to implementing Bogdanov's ideas, but he left the workers' opposition after 1929, and his name does not figure in workers' truth or workers. Excuse me. He figured left the workers' Opposition after 1921, and his name does not figure in workers' truth or workers' group. Yet party authorities conflating, conflated the three groups, representing presenting all of them as dangerous phenomena deserving of repression. says here that Yuri Mili Milonov was a Russian political activist who joined the Bolshevik faction of the Russian Social Democratic and Labor Party in 1912. Milonov was arrested in 1915 and sent on ex internal exile to Saratov. Here he is used his administrative skills to support a hospital fund for print shop workers and the agricultural census commission set up by the Zemstvo of the Samara government. Back to the text. Documents of workers' group or tr workers' truth do not belong in this collection because their programs differed significantly from that of the workers' opposition. For practical reasons, the collection heavily favors documents produced by Alexander Shlyapnikov and Sergei Medvedev, who lived together with their families in the same apartment in the last half of the 1920s and collaborated politically. I'll just read the first paragraph. There's no like formal introduction, just all one big, uh, like five paragraphs on them. But I'll read Medvedev's uh, little bio on Wikipedia. He said he lived from 1885 to 1937 and was a Russian Bolshevik revolutionary, metal worker, and trade union organizer. He was born into the peasant estate in a family of Russian ethnicity in Cortino, Moscow government, and grew up in the countryside near Moscow and in St. Petersburg. After receiving a primary school education, he began factory work at age 13. Medvedev first worked at the Obukov factory in St. Petersburg and participated in the 1901 Ukov strike. He became a socialist at age 15 and joined the Bolsheviks when the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party split in 1903. Back to the text. This slant reflects the parameters of my earlier research and the sources to which I have had access. I have attempted to include sources that I have located from other worker oppositionists in order to convey how members of the group diverged politically after it was banned, yet my choices were circumscribed by having carried out research in central Moscow and Kiev archives and having had access to only the party control and Soviet security police files on Shlyapnikov and Medvedev, not to the files of other worker oppositionists. The name of the workers' opposition was often conjured during the intra-party debates of the 1920s. Some former leaders of the workers' opposition participated in intra-party debates or attempted to do so through the 1920s until Stalin's turn toward collectivization and intensive industrialization. Lev Trotsky, Stalin, and their respective supporters claimed that the workers' opposition united or merged with the oppositionists led by Trotsky, Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev in 1925-8. The source is translated in this collection, which attempts to be as comprehensive as possible, show that the former workers' opposition never merged with other oppositions. 
Distribution of the United Opposition. Distribution by the United Opposition of documents authored by Alexander Shlepnikov and Sergei Medvedev did not signify their endorsement of the United Opposition's proposals. Um, the United Opposition was a group formed in the All Union Communist Party, Bolsheviks, in early 1926, when the left opposition led by Leon Trotsky merged with the new opposition led by Grigory Zinoviev and his close ally Lev Kamenev in order to strengthen opposition against the Joseph Stalin led center. The United Opposition demanded, among other things, greater freedom of expression within the Communist Party, the dismantling of the new economic policy more development of heavy industry and less bureaucracy. The group was effectively destroyed by Stalin's majority by the end of 1927, having had only limited success. Back to the text. It cannot be excluded that other former worker oppositionists may have supported one or other of the oppositions, but which were led, me, which were led by Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. On the other hand, the secondary literature is incorrect to assert that Shlepnikov and Medvedev made peace with the Stalinists in the 1920s. The documents in this book are organized chronologically into four chapters. Chapter 1 representing the background of the trade union debate, Two, chapter 2, focusing on the height of the trade union discussion through the 10th Party Congress. Chapter 3, surveying the period from the ban on factions through the 11th Party Congress. Closed session to consider expulsion of leading worker oppositionists from the party. Chapter 4, which covers the years until 1930 when the workers' opposition no longer existed as a faction, but its leading members still took critical stances openly within the party. The year 1930 marks the point at which they had ceased any oppositional politics, but after which false charges against them accrued to a greater degree than before. The collection does not proceed the exam to examine the false case against the former workers' opposition, which the NKVD concocted in 1935-37 to on the basis of informers' reports from the early 1930s and confessions made under interrogation by Zinoviev, Kamenev, and their supporters. This is because, first, interrogation protocols differ significantly as sources from documents generated by oppositionists when their authorship was not mediated or interpreted by the secret police. Secondly, I would not want this collection to lend credibility to the fabricated case by creating any sense of continuity. Alright, so that's the end of the introduction. <clears throat>